Hi, welcome back. Uh, this is Julie Payne, licensed marriage and family therapist. And today I'm going to go over um, a little background of myself. Um, I'm going to get a little personal here. Um, it has uh, not been easy growing up. Uh, my parents divorced when I was th like two and a half, three. Um, I don't really remember much of that. Um, when I was in second grade, my mom had um, kidney failure and ended up in the hospital um, and was on dialysis for about a year um, and then received a transplant. Um, and so for, for the majority of that year, um, there was a lot of kind of shuffling around to make sure she was able to be at dialysis, um, which was typically like after school. Um, sometimes I was there, sometimes I was with other people. Um, I never really kind of knew where I was going to end up, um, from day to day. Um, and then as I got older, um, my, my mom had the transplant for about 14 years and then um, that kidney failed and she was put back on dialysis for 10 years, um, had a lot of medical complications and things like that. Um, so I spent the majority of my uh, life making sure that my mom was okay. Um, she was sick my entire life. Um, it was something that was always, I was always aware of. Um, and I also saw her kind of push through everything. Um, if you asked her, we always joke that um, her saying was she was fine. Um, she never told you if anything was wrong. Everything really was fine, um, even though it was not. And, um, you know, that, that kind of showed me what it's like to be sick or not be sick, um, that you just push through and do what you're supposed to do, um, and manage it as it comes. Um, and the reason why I say that is because when I, um, was 25, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And, um, up until that point, I had been very active. I played sports my whole life. Um, I played varsity softball. I went to college to play softball. Um, I did horseback riding and I competed um, with that. I played just about every sport you can imagine. Um, I loved rollerblading and bike riding. Um, I raced outrigger canoes. Uh, pretty much if it was outdoors, I was there going to be doing it. Um, I was never really a fan of exercise per se, but I loved to play sports. Um, and just be active and do stuff. It really, um, it, it was my outlet in life, especially growing up. Um, and, and I didn't have the easiest, uh, childhood, um, especially with my mom, but there were other things in there and we'll get to those in other videos. Um, but it was not easy. And so sports were definitely a safe haven for me and an outlet. And so um, at 25, and it actually started when I was about 23, it took me two years to figure out what was going on with my body. Um, I had a stiff neck and I couldn't move my arms and I had, you know, trouble with my, my feet and my ankle and everything was just kind of um, falling apart on me. Um, and I couldn't, at, at one point I couldn't even um, do my hair or uh, pull a sheet over myself. Um, and I never stopped working at that time. I worked in an office and many days it would take me about 30 minutes just to get from my car to my desk. Um, and I would bring my brush to work and have a friend do my hair because I couldn't lift my arms above my head. Um, so, so much pain. Um, but I didn't know what to do other than push through. Um, and so for a long time, I really like prided myself on the fact that I never went out on disability. Um, 
that I pushed through, that I did everything. Um, during that time, I was working. I was in school full time. So I worked full time, 7.30 to 4.30. I was in school full time um, after that. And I'd get home about 10 o'clock at night. And then I'd go to the gym. Um, and so I figured it was just uh, me running myself into the ground uh, because I was doing so many things. And um, did not get the memo that I should probably stop and slow down. Um, nope, just kept pushing through and doing everything. Um, and I ended up on workers' compensation um, through my company because my wrists and my arms were so bad. Um, and honestly, I felt like I was looking like I was faking it. Because one, one day, one week, it would be my right wrist, and then it would move up to my right arm. And then the next week, it would be my left, and left wrist, left arm. And so I was, like, switching braces week to week. Um, it, it really looked like I was faking. Um, and I wasn't. I just, I had no idea what was happening to me. During that time, my mom was also in the hospital, um, and she had a stroke, and she had um, several kind of complications. Um, but so I'll go back a little bit. Um, so my company put me on workers' compensation, and I had to see the doctor then. I want to say I was about 24 at the time. This is in 2004. Um and I went in and they gave me a strength test. And I remember telling them, um, you know, that my biggest thing is I have, I have lost all the strength in my arms. And I cannot even, like, pick up a book. It hurt. It felt like my wrists were going to snap off. And the doctor at that time was like, well, here's a bunch of medication. Here's a bunch of pain meds. You're fine. I'll see you in a month. Um, and I was not happy about that. I did not want pain medication. I wanted my strength back. I wanted to not be in pain, but I wanted to know why I couldn't do anything that I was used to doing. Um, and so I kept pushing. Um, I think I went back a couple times. And it wasn't until um, I had found another, I went to an orthopedic doctor who I had seen previously for an ankle injury. And... They were running tests and doing lab work and trying to figure out what was going on because it was really, again, it was my neck, my shoulders, my arms, my ankle, my toes. Um, it was just kind of like all sporadic throughout my body. Um, and it wasn't until literally my mom was in the hospital and her rheumatologist came in um, and was talking to her. And I had asked him, you know, is there any chance that I get anything that my mom has. My mom had um, obviously kidney stuff, but she had lung issues as well. She had autoimmune disease. Um, and my mom's health was always kind of a mystery to uh, the medical community. They never really quite figured out what was happening and, and why. Um, and his response was no. Um, if I ended up with what my mom had, it would kind of be like a medical anomaly because um, the chances of it repeating exactly is very rare. Um, but he's like, but you are predisposed to an autoimmune disease. And so that was kind of in the back of my head. And then literally a couple days later, I went back to the orthopedic doctor that I was seeing and my blood work had come back and he said it was... Um, kind of concerning of like my, my sed rate and some of the labs and he wanted to refer me to a rheumatologist. And so naturally I went to the one that my mom had seen for, I don't know, like 30 years. Um, and that ended up leading to the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. And that was in October of to no that was in May of 2005 and I did not start um, I started a kind of a basic medication methotrexate which is um, for those of you who don't know super fun it's a chemotherapy medication um, and so I would take it on Friday night and I literally couldn't get out of bed till about two in the afternoon the next day um, I started to lose my hair I started to lose my eyelashes um, 
it was never really noticeable uh, to anybody else, but I certainly noticed because it was literally like falling out all over the place. Um, very tired, no energy, and um, because of the medication, I felt like I like fried in the sun very, very quickly, um, which was really tough, especially living in Southern California and um, doing beach sports. So that um, I was put on that and it got maybe like 10% better, but it really didn't get better um, until about six months later when I added um, Enbrel or my doctor added Enbrel, which is like a weekly medication um, inject injectable. Um, and that within a week, I knew, noticed the difference right away. I was um, able to move. I had more energy. I wasn't in so much pain anymore. Um, and so I started to kind of get my life back. I had gained quite a bit of weight from not being able to do anything or any of my normal activities. Um, and so that was rough. But I did kind of get it under control and was able to um, kind of get my life back in a way. Um, and then in 2009, my ankle started to hurt. My foot started to hurt and I didn't know what was going on. Um, I previously have sprained it and tore ligaments, um, all of them twice when I was younger. And so it's naturally been weak since. Um, but this was slightly different and it took, I don't even know, probably about eight months to and various doctors to try to figure out what was wrong. And of course, denial from the insurance company of saying that I didn't need an MRI and I finally did. And, um, it ended up being one of the bones in the middle of my foot had kind of just disintegrated on itself. And that led to me needing a talonavicular fusion in 2009. And um, it was four months non-weight bearing, one or two weeks uh, bedridden. Um, and I had just met my husband at that time. I did not know he would be my husband yet. Um, but I just met him and he was, uh, like dead set on taking care of me, which terrified me, honestly. Um, cause I thought like, there's no way. Um, but he did. Anyway, so the, the surgery, uh, you know, according to that doctor was successful. Um, and then I, when I started walking four months later, um, I felt like a, a snap or a tear in my tendon and I brought that to his attention and he essentially said, it's all in your head. Suck it up. There's nothing wrong. Um, and that led to more complications. Um, and then I ended up, you know, lots of physical therapy. I think I tried everything under the sun. Um, and I had met with a doctor at USC um, who looked at it and said essentially what what had torn really wasn't even connected anymore so there's really no reason that it should be hurting me at this point um and we could literally cut it out and um so I was trying to figure out kind of how to manage that and I was trying to get pregnant at the time and um he gave me probably one of like the best advice I've ever received from a doctor and he was like pregnancy will actually help loosen up those ligaments and you shouldn't feel that pain um so we can always revisit it after you have kids so uh because I was on Ambrol I went off of it um and all my medication to get pregnant um and that's what my kids are 16 months apart and that's why I literally stayed off medication to have them back to back um, and my arthritis flared through it and I, um, kind of anticipated that. So fast forward to, um, well, during my pregnancy, my first one, um, around six months, my knees really swelled up, um, to the point where like I couldn't even get in and out of a car. They were so swollen and I ended up having them drained quite a bit. And, 
Um, so I knew then I was told that I would probably need a knee replacement or knee surgery to clean up my knee after I had my children. Um, and if you remember when I said I played sports, I was a catcher in uh, high school. And so my knees were, I knew my knees would be bad in high school. I just never imagined I would end up with rheumatoid arthritis in addition to everything. Um, so that really just kind of sped up the process. So I, after having kids, I went back on medication um, and discovered that my body did not respond to Embril anymore. And so then I went to a couple different other medications. One of them I reacted to, and then I ended up finally being put on what they call the, um, the heavy guns or the big guns, um, Rituxan, and which is another uh, chemotherapy medication, um, lower doses for RA, but it's still pretty intense. Um, but that finally started to really work. Um, so I went off medication in 2011 and I was off until 2014. Um, and so finally that started to get better, but I ended up needing a knee replacement. Um, I had a knee replacement done in Texas and I was scheduled for my other knee about six months later. Um, and I ended up being able to buy some time on that. And I, uh, was able to push it, what, a good, like, five years. Um, sorry, there is a lot, a lot to talk about when it comes to my medical and um, of my rheumatoid arthritis. But that's why I'm doing this video, so you guys can get an idea of what it's um, been like and what it's, uh, what I've been through and so where my perspective is and where I'm at now. Um, so you get a little background information on, on what I experienced um, and continue to battle. Um, so fast forward to 2015 um, or 2016, we moved back to California. Um, and uh, so the last four years have been... Um, probably one of the hardest of or the hardest kind of group of years of my life um yes considering everything that I have been through in my past um but in the last four years and really actually since 2019 I had another knee replacement. I had an ankle surgery. I had an ankle replacement. The ankle replacement was right as COVID hit. So um, my surgery actually got canceled and then it got put back on. And then I was told that the kids would be home. So I was non weight bearing um, and not walking for a month with kids home in the middle of a pandemic trying to do school. Super fun. I do not advise it. Um, and then that led to one more foot surgery to fix the issue um, that the doctor did in 2009. Um, I said that surgery was successful and the fusion was, except the doctor put an arch in my foot um, that did not ha like exist before. And so if you look at my one foot, it is fairly flat. And then my other foot has a very clear arch, which makes my foot kind of roll to the outside. And when I had my ankle replaced, I actually had mobility in my ankle that I had not had in a good 20 years. Um, and so my ankle just kept rolling to the outside every time I walked. Um, and I was terrified that I was going to screw up um, this joint that I had just had put in. Um, I will say out of all the replacements, so two knees and an ankle, um, the knees hurt exponentially more than the ankle, probably because I'm up and walking and did stairs the same day as the knee replacement and the ankle replacement. I got to put it up and not walk on it for a month. Um, so pain-wise, it was less, um, but 
I am also off of medication during each of those surgeries. So my RA tends to flare and get bad, um, which includes my wrists. Um, and so it, it has been just multiple surgery after surgery, um, in addition to everything else that is going on, um, in, in the world and in our lives and things like that. Um, and so this video is really just kind of a background on my medical stuff. So you get an idea as I talk a little bit more about, um, just kind of perspective and things that have come up of, um, in addition to physically not feeling well, um, managing medications, managing surgeries, um, chronic pain, chronic illness type stuff. Um, and those of you who are going to see this that also have chronic pain, chronic illness, um, I get it. It is, it's undescribable if you've never, um, experienced it and so many times physicians um, in the medical community give the impression that um, you're making it up or uh, you're exaggerating or it's in your head or um, you know people assume that you're lazy or you know you don't look sick you don't look like, um, you know, you're hurting. And so that is definitely a challenge. I have had many, many nasty notes left on my car. I have um, had nasty looks from people. I do have a handicap placard. I've had it since I was 25. Um, and so I do get the struggles that, that come with it and come with looking like you're fine um, and the internal struggle of feeling very, very intense pain every time you try to move. Um, and so that has kind of been the, the medical history. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why I specialize in working with chronic illness and chronic pain. Um, I developed rheumatoid arthritis before I became a therapist. Um, and I went to grad school to be a therapist. Uh, I, literally a year after being diagnosed. Um, so a lot of managing my illness and managing um, how to be sick, how to be um, hurt or in pain um, and have medical stuff was through grad school while I really had to push through. Um, and that's where I say I, I did not take any time off and I pushed through. And so it's really not until the last couple years where I have realized that it's okay to um, give myself a break. It's okay to uh, have a quote unquote lazy day. Um, so I have more energy for uh, things later on. It's okay not to get everything um, done and accomplished. It's okay to take care of yourself. And that is one of those things that um, I talked about with my, you know, growing up with my mom, I never learned how to actually take care of yourself when you're sick or when you're not feeling good because it was modeled that you just push through and you're fine. Um, and so I adopted that mentality of I'm fine. I didn't need any help. Um, I was very stubborn. There were times where I couldn't open like a bottle, um, and I would have to get somebody to help. Um, and it took a long time to be able to ask somebody for help. I would try for about 15 minutes, just in tears, trying to open a bottle. Uh, there was one time in particular where I had gone to a gas station and I was so thirsty. I think I went in and got a Gatorade. And sometimes like if you've had Gatorade, you know, sometimes those lids are like on there crazy tight. Um, and I was literally in the car for about 15 minutes just trying my hardest to open that sucker. And I couldn't do it. And I finally gave up. And I went into the gas station and asked the attendant to open it for me. Um, and I was in my my mid-20s. And the guy looked at me like, what the hell? Like, why can't you can't open this yourself? Um, and I let him open it and walked back out. And it was 
so hard to be able to ask for that help. I had always been the strong one. Um, my family knew me as the strong one. And so a switching to one that needed help instead of being the helper um, has been a huge shift. Um, and it continues to be something that I work on all the time. Um, those of you that know me or um, have met me know that I do a lot of stuff. Um, and the last couple of years have really, you know, been making a conscious effort to take care of myself, put myself first, um, what I need, and then be able to do it for other people. And so with this video, um, I say all this because I, it's really important to take care of yourself and it's okay if you're not always the strong one. It's okay to ask for help. It actually takes a tremendous amount of strength to be able to ask for help. Um, and our society, unfortunately, does not foster that. Our society very much pushes that you don't ask for help, that you do things yourself, um, that you suck it up and continue to just push forward. And that is not, um, that's not beneficial. It's not what is, is good for us. Um, and it just creates more problems, more difficulties, more challenges, um, to allow yourself to heal and, and move through that so you can live the life that you want. Um, even if it's not necessarily the one that you thought you would have. So I hope you uh, learned a little bit more. I hope this resonated with you. Um, everything that I share in here is to give you hope, um, perspective that you're not alone, that uh, other people go through this as well and the challenges of it. Um, give yourself some compassion and acceptance to take care of yourself, it's okay. It's okay to ask for help. Um, it's okay to take a break. We don't always have to be productive. Um, and sometimes productive is getting back in bed and letting yourself rest and taking care of yourself. So thank you for joining me today. Um, I look forward to posting more videos um, and sharing kind of more of my insight um, and perspective. Uh, again, if there's any questions or anything, please comment, um, share. I'm happy to answer any questions and I'm happy to create videos and content um, based on any feedback that you guys give me. Thank you and have a wonderful day.